as I said before, I was supposed to be in Cameroon today. Um, not that I couldn't preach a sermon. I feel like uh, somebody told me a good word a long time ago, always be prepared to give a sermon. So I could give a sermon, but, but I have an awesome opportunity this morning to get to sit under two men I really respect that I work with every single week, uh, Pastor Brian and Pastor Sam, can you guys come up here? And so they're going to bring the word for us today, um, and they got something special for us. And so I want to pray for the word, and we're going to let them, let them get going. So Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray you administer to us today. Excite our hearts, convict us, encourage us, bring us into deeper relationship with you. And we pray that, Lord, you would stir something deep within us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys have the floor. Amen. Thank you. So first we want to do just a quick recap of the past eight weeks or so, seven weeks, we've been talking about the values at this church. Um, And this is sort of the culmination of those weeks. Um, But first, the first thing we talked about was relationship instead of religion. And that is just about how we want to prioritize our relationship with God instead of the the dogma or getting caught up in the weeds of um, how religion has functioned. And not that those things are bad, but just uh, making sure that we keep um, first things first, that is our relationship with Christ. And the second two weeks, we talked about uh, becoming missionaries, that we are first missionary, but we are missionaries first. And in that, um, developing a, a discipleship culture where everyone's a disciple, everyone's a missionary, and moving that uh, to develop other missionaries. And that's our primal uh, reason for meeting. And then we talked about supernatural instead of superficial and just how the missionary church was founded on this wild supernatural move of God and how uh, we don't want to lose sight of that. And we want to invite the Spirit into what we're doing um, just as, as we continue. And then last week, Jordan, uh, one of the things he said that was really poignant was, our purpose at this church is to seek God and his presence. And so where we are today is establishing that we are about encounter over uh, entertainment. And as you look at um, uh, the, the church across the world, it is something that entertainment seems to kind of move in and out of, of the church and kind of begins to uh, steal from what the Lord is in, encountering in him. And so um, we want to show you just a quick video that kind of, it's funny, but it is a lot of truth in it. Uh, I think you'll see uh, our, our point and our, our launch point here. Yo! Oh, bro! It's been a while. You know what you should do? Come to our church. Dude! You can tithe with crypto. We have keto communion. We have our own app. Our pastor just dropped a merch collab with Adidas. Tony Romo is speaking at our men's retreat. Sadie Robertson spoke last week. Our pastor prophesied the Super Bowl last year. Our worship leader drinks. Blippi's the children's church pastor. Our pastor writes his own book. You know Taylor Swift? Mm-hmm. Her nephew Trevor? He goes here. We got a rock climbing Bible study. We got a motorcycle small group. Spin class small group. Charcuterie board small group. Our worship leader was on American Idol. He ain't win though. Tell him to come to our church. Come to our church. Our pastor gave away a Toyota Solera to a single mother. On stage. Go. Joanna Gaines decorated our lobby. The whole thing. We spent half a million dollars on moving lights. Our head of security used to play for the Cowboys. Mm-hmm. Young Sheldon goes to our Sunday school. We've only been audited by the IRS. Twice. Twice. We're all inclusive. Unless you disagree with us on something. You can join in the metaverse. Sometimes our pastor wears a hoodie. And a sports coat. <laughs> our youth services are so intense, they call it Astro World. Ah! We do a sermon series called At the Movies. Our church bought a used F-18 for a sermon called Top God. God. Come to our church. You need to be there. Slide to our church, bro. What time? 9 and 11. Never forget. Mm, come, come to our church. Come to our church. I just joined First Baptist. What? Forget it. Don't come to our church. Lose my number. So that's what we don't want to be like, right? We want to be able to say, you know, go to First Baptist if you're going to encounter God there. We're about encounter instead of entertainment. And not that entertainment's bad, but um, our first and foremost thing should be to encounter God. And we're going to be talking about that. But first, let's go. Go ahead and turn to Exodus 19. We're going to be hitting a lot of scripture this morning, so if... If you're tired or if you're not okay with that, um, go ahead and buckle in, because it might be um, like sitting in front of a fire hose this morning. 
So we're going to start Exodus 19, starting in verse 5. This is, to give a little bit of background, this is Moses, um, and God is talking to him on Mount Sinai. He's up in God's presence, and God is talking to him face to face. He's encountering God, and God tells him this covenant. He says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So God is with Moses on this mountain, and he's saying, you are going to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, all of, all of Israel. And then so Moses, to, to go ahead and paraphrase the next couple of verses, Moses goes down the mountain and brings these words to the people and says to the people what God had said, that we're going to be a chosen people, we're a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, invites them all into that. And they say, we're, we're, we're in it. I do. You know, if this were a marriage covenant, they'd be it. I do. Um, all the Lord has commanded we will do, they say. So God goes back up the mountain, and he tells them, he tells God, they said, you know, we, they do. They're, they're going to um, do everything that you've commanded to them. But if you know the end of the story, um, that, that desire for God will sort of ebb, and they're going to um, make some mistakes along the way. But let's just go ahead and keep reading. Um, well, actually, first, a little bit more paraphrase before we get on to verse 16. These next couple of verses, God is giving them these um, ceremonial covenant outline of what God's going to do and these instructions for how they are to prepare themselves, to purify themselves. Um, and so he says, be ready for the third day. On the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai, and you must set boundaries around the mountain. And don't even touch the edge, don't get near it. Um, but when the ram, ram's horn sounds a long blast, they may ascend up onto the mountain. And that translation might be a little bit different in, in, your, um, in your Bible, depending on what translation you're uh, reading. Some say they are to go to the edge of the mountain, but I choose to say um, intentionally that God says, once the ram's horn sounds, they are to ascend up onto the mountain. He's inviting them up into his presence on this third day. And so we get to verse 16. If you want to follow along, it says, On the morning of the third day, there was a thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very large loud trumpet blast. So all these things that God was talking about is happening. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So at, at this point, the story kind of pauses. Um, this ram's horn that's blasting it invites the reader to ask, okay, why aren't they going up the mountain? That's what God says, said, right? So you're kind of wondering that. Why aren't they going up? The ram's horn sounding, and then it even repeats uh, a couple verses later, that the ram's horn grew louder and louder. And so this is intentionally introducing this contradiction in the story, meant to be sort of a puzzle so you can meditate on the scripture and, and really uh, ruminate on it. And some, the NIV, ESV, not, not to dog on them, but they've tried to smooth, smooth over the translation to say, you know, maybe they weren't even supposed to go up onto the mountain. Maybe, let's just say, he meant to stay at the edge of the mountain, because that's what they did, right? They, they were afraid they, of the thunder and the lightning, and so they, they stayed back at the, at the foot of the mountain, because they were afraid of dying. But if we keep reading, we're going to see um, how this was a test that God was putting them through, and how they failed the test. So Moses goes up the mountain alone, long story short, and God gives him these Ten Commandments. He comes back down. We've heard the Ten Commandments. We can't talk about them all today. But Moses, he comes back down to the people, and the narrative of this story picks back up in Exodus 20, verse 18, which we can read together in 20 if you flip the page. Uh, it says, when the people saw the thunder and lightning, so this is a flashback again, this is the same story that just happened. When people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear, they stayed at a distance. And Moses said, speak, to, and they said to Moses, sorry, speak to us yourself and we'll listen but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. And just briefly, I want to explain how this is such a heartbreaking story that where God invites them to become this kingdom of priests. He says, here's, here's our marriage covenant. You're going to come up to the mountain, into my presence when, we, when the ram's horn blasts and all this thunder and stuff. And they hear it happening, and when they, they heard the trumpet, they, they trembled in fear. And they, it says they stayed at a distance. So not only did they 
they didn't just stand on the edge, but they stood at a distance. And they said to Moses, you know, speak to us yourself. You, you can be our mediator. You can be our priest. And we'll just receive from you because we're afraid. And, but, but Moses tries to say, no, you guys, don't be afraid. God has come to test you. This is a test so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. But the people remained at a distance. So this is just so heartbreaking. I, I, I like to think of what could have happened if, if they did go up the mountain, how God would have maybe honored that. And, and God used it. We're going to look at the gospel. But God... God called them to be a kingdom of priests, and they chose to be a kingdom with priests, or a kingdom with a priest, or with a mediator, rather than being in the presence of God themselves, rather than encountering God for themselves. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's so much easier um, to have someone go to the Lord for you and uh, come back and kind of regurgitate what he heard. That's, that's really what the children of Israel were doing. They were doing their own thing, Moses, you go up, we're just going to stand here at the edge of the mountain. We're not going to have our own encounter with God. You have the encounter. Just come back and tell us what's going on. And so many times when we think about uh, the, the idea of church and about gathering, we kind of have that on our, on our brains like, you know, Pastor Jordan, you go to the Lord this week. Now you tell us what God said and we'll just kind of listen and we become an audience instead of going to the Lord, encountering him, and allowing for God to use the Holy Spirit to move us. And that's the thing that we kept running when we were meeting this week and praying this week and listening this week was over and over. Um, it's not that entertainment is bad, but it is in the sense where we cease to be people who are expecting or anticipating an encounter with God when we get together. And we see that in Exodus 32. Um, A.W. Tozer said, and this, is, this guy always hits home, uh, he kind of says things in a way that only he can say it, but he says the church that can't worship or encounter, encounter God has to be entertained. And the man that can't lead worship must provide entertainment. And, you know, someone like um, Sam here, there's, there's a lot of pressure on people who lead worship today because there are so many ideas out there on what worship and singing and all those things are. You know, what, you know, who do you listen to? Are you a Bethel guy or are you more of a Maverick City guy or are you old school Southern Baptist? And you have all these people with preferences. And so we're going to see in the next, uh, in Exodus 32, what happens when the children of Israel pressure Aaron, who's the worship guy. So, uh, turn in your Bibles to Exodus 32, and we see Moses is, is now up on the mountain. He's hearing from God. God is writing and scripting uh, the tablets, and he says, it says in um, chapter 32, when the people saw that Moses was long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, who's the worship guy, and said, come make us gods who will go up before us. As for Moses, who brought us out of Egypt, we don't even know what has happened to him. So he's been there for 40 days. And so Aaron, probably, we don't know. You know, it's kind of like, did he feel pressure? Uh, why, what possessed him to say, uh, did he just make it up as he went? And he was just going, uh, go gather your gold things, you know? Or, but the pressure to stir something. Because here's the issue. They were below, they had already chosen not to go encounter God. And so by default, they're down there and like, uh, Aaron, you know, basically stir it up, uh, get, get the fire going, and they had no encounter. Yeah. So, um, so Aaron answered them, take off your gold earrings, your wives and, and sons and daughters, have everybody bring it to the center, and you know the story. We're going to make a gold calf, we're going to fashion it, we're going to be around it, we're going to dance around it. Um, these are your gods, and it's just, it's just crazy to think. They fashioned a bull, put it in the center, and they said, this is your God who led you out of Egypt. So the very thing that, that God was trying to rescue them from, they just keep jumping back in. I, if you don't get anything else, if you're better with pictures and movies, I have a short clip. This describes, this, this is the children of Israel, what's going on here. Boom, right. dicky, boom, dicky, boom, dicky, boom. Dick 
At that, so sound familiar? We we are that, right? We're that. And so, verse down at verse nine, Moses comes down off the mountain, and and we know that because of their obstinance, um, verse nine says, "I have seen these people." The Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff necked or they're obstinate. Um, they're difficult to lead. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make into this a great nation. It says, but Moses fought, and we know that Moses um, asked the Lord to relent. He did. And, and verse 15, which is a really interesting uh, passage to the end. So if you read verse 15 and on, it says, Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets and the covenant of law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets, which is really awesome, were the work of God. I mean, God worked them. God wrote them. The writing was the writing of God engraved on tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people in the shouting, he says to Moses, there is sound of war in the camp. And Moses replies, and I think it's so, it's just such a, a, a astounding three verses here. It says, Moses says, it's not the sound of victory or celebration. It's not even the sound of defeat or a dirge or uh, of brokenness. It is the sound of singing that I hear. That word singing is also the word we use in the Old Testament for noise. All I hear is noise, not celebration, not brokenness. It's just noise. And so I think about it sometimes when we, we come into a service or in our day before the Lord, and what is it that the Lord hears when we're present in front of him? Does he, does he have the exaltation in our hearts or the brokenness we feel when we are confessing? Or does he just feel noise? Yeah, and that's to the point that we can experience, we can come to God and, and sing worship songs and read scripture and we can, la we can miss him. We cannot experience him. And to point back to the fall, this, let's go back to the garden. If you go to Genesis 3, um, this is kind of where it all started. Um, in Genesis 3, 8, um, there's a sound, kind of like what you were talking about. This, the same word in Hebrew, kol, is a sound for thunder um, or, or voice. And it's the same word that was used in Exodus when the thunder was coming onto the mountain. It said, um, the sound, sound is happening. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So this is after they had chosen to sin, chosen to fall, and um, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we start to see humanity turn from God. And even, it's so heartbreaking, and again, because they're in the presence of God, and then they have to be exiled away from his presence. And then in this point in, in Exodus 19, where God's inviting him back into his presence, they say, you know, we'll stay in exile. We'll stay, so we'll stay away from your presence. Um, and that relates to how we are today. Well, the gospel, Jesus came and and he shed his blood for us so that we could have life. And in 1 Peter 2, 9, we rep he repeats, Paul repeats that covenant to us that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the pr praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So this promise wasn't just for Moses, but the promise is for us today and how we are a priesthood. And it's not even just the people on stage. It's not just me or Jordan or Brian, like we, we are priesthood, all of us, not just the mediator. We want to be a kingdom of priests, kingdom of worshipers. And when we, when we come into his presence, go ahead, Jordan, we can go to the first point. Um, we want to practice his presence. If you're taking notes, these are, are, are three sort of bullets we want to get across that. The first is to practice his presence. And like we said, we, we can come into his presence or we can come into the church expecting to encounter him and miss him if, if, we, if we aren't coming with the right motivations. I think what I've learned, what God's teaching me is that we can come to God for a whole host of things. We can come to God for what he can do for us or for, to chase a feeling that we felt before in a worship experience. Or we can come to him 
um, for a healing or for, for something we need from him. And that, those are all good things, and he answers those prayers. He meets us in it, but a lot of times he can teach us that, my son, my daughter, I want you to come for me. I want you to treasure me. And when we do treasure him, then all will be added. When we seek first his kingdom, all will be added. But what I want to get across is that we can prioritize the presence of God in seeking his face, and then everything else can come second. But if, if we start to get used to encountering God, seeking his face, and then him doing something for us out of his grace, we can get used to that and think, okay, I'm going to go back into his presence because it was, it was good for me. I, I got something out of it. But we can miss, we can miss him. We can miss his presence. The struggle, I think the, app, the application is he's invisible, right? And so practicing his presence is a supernatural thing yeah. by faith. Yeah, and so faith. it's not like we get to go in front of you know, God today or live life. And, but the discipline is, is remembering that he's present and that we encounter him in faith. So. Yeah, it takes faith to, to, to know that he's with us, to know that he's in this room right now, that I'm not just talking um, to you all, but he's listening to us as well. And it takes faith to behold his beauty. Eric Gilmore, if you're familiar with him, he said, Jesus doesn't lack beauty, men lack eyes. And so, yeah, yeah, if you're taking notes, again, people, Jesus doesn't lack beauty, men lack eyes. He doesn't, it's not that he lacks speaking, but we lack ears to hear him speaking sometimes. So my prayer for us all this morning is that we would open our ears in faith and, and open our eyes in faith to see his beauty, to behold his presence. And then secondly, uh, we have that proximity isn't enough, that you can be next to somebody and not, not encounter him, not know him. You, imagine sitting next to somebody, a stranger at, on an airplane, and you might not talk to them. If you don't talk to them, you're not going to know anything about them, where they're going, where they're, you might know where they're, they're going, but um, you won't know anything about them. But if you have a conversation with them, if you start to begin to ask and to have a relationship, um, then, then you can know more about them. But proximity isn't enough. Proximity doesn't mean presence. So again, yeah, we can choose to be close to Jesus without even seeing him. We can listen but not hear. And then thirdly, this is what Jesus is calling us. He's, he's always saying, come. He said to the people of Israel, come up into my presence on the mountain. And it's interesting this morning, the verse you read, you said, I feel like the Lord is saying something to us today. So you were listening to him. And the first word you used was, I can go ahead and read come. It. And I looked over at Sam, I'm like, he didn't know we were, this was one of our points. And so it's like, that's how the Holy Spirit connects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of really cool connections. I'll read it again. Hosea 6, come, let's return to the Lord. He himself um, has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bandage our wounds. So we see him inviting us to come, and we'll be healed in his presence. In this, in, also in the New Testament, in many occasions, Jesus calls us to come. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he says, come to the water. He's, he's the well of living water when he meets with the Samaritan woman. He just says to come, and that's, that's all he asks of us. We don't have to come like Jordan was talking about. We don't have to button up our shirts all the way. We don't have to do anything to earn the invitation to come, but it's a free invitation. He's extending his hand out to us. But sometimes, like the Israelites, something is holding us back. And maybe it is our fear. Maybe we're trembling. Maybe it's our fear of what could happen if we come into his presence, or maybe it's like in Exodus 32, maybe it's an idol. Maybe the shiny golden calf is, is more beautiful to us than the beauty of Jesus. And so there's things that are holding us back from coming, but that doesn't mean he's not there with open arms asking for us to come. And there's simplicity to coming to him. It's that we can come to him for him alone, like I was talking about earlier. We don't have to come to him for anything else but to seek his face, to seek his presence. And... Um, yeah, just his invitation to come is what I believe he's asking or in inviting us into today. Yeah, we were, we met a lot. We probably met more. We prayed more this week together than we have in a long time. And our biggest question to God was, what do you want to do Sunday? Like, what, what is it that you're asking us to do? And this was the thing that probably was the, the loudest as we were listening was, I just want you to come. Um, for some, it might be coming for the first time. Maybe you've been watching what has going on 
uh, and you've observed Jesus around other people, and it's starting to make sense, and he's been moving on you. For some of you today, it, it may be for the, you're, you're coming for the first time. Uh, for some, uh, it may be, okay, you're pretty close, you're proximate, but you've really, really never come all the way to me. And it's like he, it, there's a confession in, involved in that. And, and then lastly, it's, it's the ones where we're, we think we're, we're close enough, but he's just saying, no, move in, move in closer, because I have more words. One of the things that um, the verses God gave to us this week was, was the picture of the father in Luke 15 of the prodigal. But while the boy was still far off, it, what does it say? It says, the father saw him or her, it could be us today either, felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Yeah, so the father isn't just saying, come and I'll make you do all the work and you have to run to me. But when the father saw his son who had been wayward, he, he runs to him. He puts aside his dignity and God is doing the same to us, that he's running after us, um, wanting us to come. And like Brian said, it could be us coming to the first time. It could be a come closer. There's no, there's no amount of understand we can't understand god's beauty in fullness and there's always more to to see in his in his grace and in his majesty and beauty and glory so wherever you're at this morning whether it's maybe it's laying down an idol maybe it's putting aside um, something that isn't getting in front of you but getting between you and god or maybe it is coming to God for the first time and saying, God, I want this new life that you can give me. Second Corinthians says, the old is gone and the new has come. God gives us that new life just by coming to him. And it says in Acts 2 that all who call on the name of the Lord will be healed, will be met. And then James 4, 8 says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So God doesn't meet us or he meets us in our coming. Rachel's going to sing, and we thought about how can we choreograph this, you know? We're not sure. We don't know what God necessarily wants to do. Um, it, means, it may mean that you come to the front and kneel. It, it may mean that you, um, in your heart, come near. It may mean you need to get along with him somewhere else in the church. But when we encounter him, there's always... Um, what is God wanting me to do? What is he saying to me? And how do I respond to that? So as Rachel sings, um, just allow God to, to move your heart, uh, to come close to him, and um, just respond accordingly, whatever that means. Um, don't worry about your neighbor. Um, don't worry about your spouse right now. Um, just allow him to move your heart. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Jesus, I thank you for your blood. I thank you for your life, that you didn't taste death until you did to just defeat it. And you offer us that life by your blood, God. Thank you for inviting us to come and for your free grace that you offer us, God that there's nothing we can do to earn it. But God, you offer it so freely and you lavish us with your love. So God, I pray that we would be worshipers, people who encounter you, not just in, in church on Sunday morning, but that we would be worshipers in the workplace, that we'd be worshipers in our neighborhoods and in our kitchens and in our, um, in our living rooms, God, everywhere, that we would worship you, that we'd encounter you that we would live our lives unto you, God. We sacrifice our humility, our pride, God. We, we come in humility to you, and we want to see your face every day, every moment. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I just want to bless you guys with this final benediction if you'd like to join with me and stand. It says, Now to the one 
who is able to keep you from falling and to cause you to stand, rejoicing without blemish before his glorious presence. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and for all eternity. Amen. Go in peace.